My name is Jennifer Jewell Gentsch Stevens Owen. I am the daughter of Carl Eugene Gentsch and Ruth Carolyn Pollard Gentsch. My mother is the daughter of Frank and Ella Mae Pollard. Frank had three wives, my grandmother being his first. My grandmother Ella Mae died when my mother was 12 years old from a shooting at the store where she worked. A man was holding her sister wife at gunpoint to rob the store and my grandmother stepped between them to try to help the situation. She aggravated the robber and was shot and killed. My father, Carl Gentsch, had eight wives and 42 children. I am his very youngest, number 42. My father always called me his little caboose. Here is a picture of some of his children. I am the little girl standing very close to him. He was always my very best friend. He was 72 years old when I was born and everybody thought he was my grandfather. I will begin with my grandfather, Arthur Eugene Gentsch. Arthur Gentsch was born January 4th, 1881 in Saxony, Germany. They started teaching him foreign languages at age four. In Europe, the countries are about the size of our states and the distance apart are about the same. So there are many different languages in a relatively small area. Arthur's father was very unhealthy and he died when Arthur was only 15 years old. Arthur went looking for work in Poland and then to Sweden. He had learned to speak Polish, Norwegian, Dutch, Swedish, Danish, Russian, besides his native tongue of German. While in Sweden, he got a job working in the stone yard carving names in headstones. The stone yard was managed by a man and his sons. He didn't have a place to stay, so the man invited him to the house to live. The man had a 14-year-old daughter that Arthur became very fond of. Her name was Alma Victoria Sandal. In the summers, he worked in Germany. In the winters, he worked in Sweden for Alma's father. Arthur eventually asked if he could court Alma. Her father gave permission. They had a courting table in their home. A courting table is a round table with two sides that could fold down. The two would sit at the table, fold the sides down, and hold hands. They were married on May 18, 1900, two weeks before her 17th birthday. Arthur was 20 years old. My father, Carl, was their firstborn child. He was born November 15, 1901. They stayed in Sweden until after their second child was born. His name was Arthur Olaf Israel Gentsch, born February 10, 1904. The Mormon missionaries had visited the home of Alma's father. He was satisfied with his religion, but Carl's father, Arthur Eugene, was interested and joined the church. Arthur and Alma were baptized in a river. They set sail for America when their son, Art, was six weeks old. Port of entry was Ellis Island. My dad remembers his mother crying when she first saw the Statue of Liberty. The family arrived in New York on April 17, 1904. They stayed in New York until Mormon missionaries helped them find work. Carl was born with his name spelled with a K, but the family changed it to be spelled with a C when they came to America, because that was the American way of spelling it. Arthur found temporary work as a stone cutter in Philadelphia, then in Cincinnati, Ohio, then in Chicago, Illinois. Arthur then headed west looking for work. Alma and the two children eventually followed. They ended up in Salt Lake City after a few years. The family moved to 2nd East and 17th South. There they lived in the chicken coop while the dad built a home. They had several children, one who was nicknamed Henny because he was born in a hen house. 
My dad was in tune with the spirit of the Holy Ghost at a very young age. While in school, the teacher would write questions on the chalkboard for the children to answer. He knew what the answer was going to be before the teacher finished writing the question. He could see the answer in his mind's eye. Carl would blurt out the answer to the question. Then the teacher would become very upset because he thought Carl was somehow cheating. The teacher would slap his hands with a ruler until they were swollen. Mother Alma also had extra help from the other side. One day at the Gench home, two men knocked on the door and asked for a meal. Mother Alma had just finished baking some bread. She prepared them a meal. Then after they ate, they told her that her home would always be blessed and she would always have grain in her barrel. After the two men walked out the door, Alma noticed the bread they had eaten was there again, as if she hadn't served any. So Carl went outside to follow the men. They disappeared as they went around the barn, nowhere to be found again. Later in life, my dad told me he wondered if those two men could have been two of the three wandering Nephites. Arthur wanted to make sure the boys were raised with responsibilities, so he figured a farm would be the best place for the family. In 1918, they moved to Hinkley, Utah. There, the Gench family was introduced to the Webb family. There, my dad met a 13-year-old girl who would become his first wife. I will now read to you from Vita's journal. The turning point of my life was the spring of 1918. I was very religiously tromping hay as Dad threw it up by the large fork, fulls on the hay rack. My oldest brother came chugging up in a 1916 Model T Ford. Sitting at his side was a very handsome city-looking boy named Carl Gench. He was about five feet six and a half inches tall with coal black hair and dark brown eyes. My brother introduced Carl to my father. Then apologetically he hurriedly said, and my sis Vita. I had to remove the wad of alfalfa from my parched mouth before I could say, Hi! Carl just sat there and looked at me, my long field mouse colored braids hanging from each side of my sunburned face seemed to match my faded blue jeans and bright red shirt, whose tails enjoyed the great outdoors, too. I didn't feel embarrassed for all of my thirteen years. I enjoyed being a tomboy, and mere boys didn't mean a thing to me. Carl became conscious of his staring, and then turned to my brother and said, This is my future wife. My brother hurriedly drove away and made sure we didn't see each other for quite a while. Nevertheless, our friendship grew, and soon the entire town of Hinkley knew the little web girl had a steady boyfriend. I could tell that from the way my father lived his life that he knew the Spirit was whispering to him the truth, and that he knew Vita was to be his wife some day. One day, Vita rode her pony to the Gench house to see Carl. She saw Arthur roughing Carl up. Arthur was often mad at him and seemed quite angry. So she rode her pony back home. Carl came over to the Webb house later that evening. He said he was tired of his dad beating him up. She loved Carl very much and she didn't like to see him so sad. So she helped Carl run away from home that night. Carl was only 17. My dad went looking for work. He found a job in Wyoming as a cook working with sheep herders. The outskirts of the country always harbored relocated criminals trying to build a life away from the law. Carl cooked for men who told stories about riding with Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. My dad told me once that one of the ex-gang members told him he wanted to show him something. The man took him up on a plateau and searched for a particular spot. When the man was satisfied with the location, he began to dig, and what he dug up was a skull. The skull had some gold teeth, and he took them out, probably to cash the gold in for money. The Gench family failed at farming in Hinkley because the alkali killed the crops, and Arthur Gench was a stonecutter, not a farmer. They moved to Blackfoot, Idaho, onto an Indian reservation. 
Arthur and the family lived in a two-bedroom shack. Here is a picture of the Gench home in Blackfoot. Carl moved back home to help the family. Life was difficult, but he enjoyed his time with the Indians. Carl noticed that the Indian women did a good job taking care of their husbands, and he thought it would be nice to marry an Indian. He even had a young Indian girl give him a hug. She had apparently fallen in love with him, but he put the idea of marrying her out of his head because he knew that he had had to ask Heavenly Father for help in marriage. Farm life in Idaho by the Indian Reservation was hard. Carl was once going home from the Indians on horseback. It was in the middle of a snowstorm, and he was very cold. He couldn't find his way due to the heavy falling snow. To prevent from freezing to death, Carl lay down on the horse, staying as close as possible to draw heat from the horse. He trusted that the horse would help him get back home. The horse walked slowly, but did make it home safely with Carl on his back. Vita Webb's mother wrote Carl a letter asking him to come stay with them for a short while because Vita was missing Carl greatly. He took the train down to Salt Lake. She rushed out to greet Carl. The two had deeply missed each other. Carl stayed with the webs a week, then the two went up to Blackfoot to stay in the Gench home for two weeks. He then went back to Salt Lake City with Vita and began to look for work. Work was scarce and only married men were finding jobs so Carl ventured out a long ways to find work. He would ride the train from state to state, jumping cars to avoid the bulls or policemen who removed stowaways. He went as far as Nebraska. One time, Carl hadn't eaten for three days, and it was winter. He was sitting in a rail car. An officer saw him and told him to get out. Carl could hardly move. The officer recognized that Carl was freezing to death, so he dragged him to a rail car station to find food and warmth because he couldn't walk on his own. A nice woman fed Carl back to strength. He appreciated the kindness of the officer who saved his life. After becoming discouraged about finding work, Carl enlisted in the Navy for four years. It broke Vita's heart to think she would not see him for that long. But then he was released after a short spell as the Navy downsized. He returned home to be with her. The Gench family had moved back to Salt Lake after losing their potato crop to cold weather in Blackfoot. Arthur Gench got a job as a stonecutter working for the American Marble Company. Carl and Vita were engaged for a year, then we were finally married on March 22, 1922. Carl studied hard in an electrical course that Vita had bought him. He always wanted to be an electrician. Radio was just coming of age and making itself into the wealthy homes. Carl built himself a radio, and he and Vita enjoyed some richness in their very poor, humble beginnings. Vita became pregnant and was close to being ready to give birth. Carl and Vita were driving home when their car slid off and hit a little boy standing with his mother at a bus stop. They rushed the boy to the hospital. The boy turned out fine, just scratched up a bit, but the incident put Vita into labor. The doctor took the baby out because the delivery wasn't progressing well. He set the baby girl off to the side. They were trying to keep Vita alive. The baby wasn't breathing, and Vita was hemorrhaging and had passed out. They assumed the baby didn't make it and was focusing on saving Vita. But Mother Gench had taken the baby and moved her back and forth between hot and cold water until the baby began to breathe. Carl's first child was born. They named her Eugenia. She is my oldest sister and is 50 years older than I am. Carl and Vita drove around the West looking for work. They went to California where he was working temporarily in San Francisco. Vita became pregnant again, so Carl moved her back to Utah to be with the doctors who understood her challenges with delivery. He then got a full-time job in Oregon working as an electrician helper. He had a dream that Heavenly Father had a job for him on a high mountain, so he packed up and moved back to Utah. There, he applied for a job in Bingham Canyon. 
He was hired as a laundry worker. The man who held the job had died the night Carl had the dream. This man who died was also the Bingham Bishop. Carl and Vita moved into the bishop's house. I'm now going to read Vita's account of moving into the bishop's home. The late bishop's house was well furnished, even to his large ecclesiastical library. We browsed through those old books, many of the texts written by founding Mormon leaders. For the first time, we saw a new side to the Mormon philosophy. There were truths given personally to Joseph Smith, basic, fundamental, as recorded in the Doctrine Covenants that were never talked about. We studied and pondered. Could this be the same religion that we had so taken for granted? During these years, we lived as any other average married couple. Though life in Bingham wasn't so pleasant, it was here the deeper ideals and principles of the LDS Church entered our lives. We enjoyed studying the Book of Mormon, the ancient records of the forebears of the American Indians, as translated by Joseph Smith. In the Old Testament, God sanctioned the plural marriage as lived by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hannah, a plural wife, was honored by God with a son, Samuel, who became a great prophet of God. The early church leaders also pointed the way to plural marriage and other standard works of the church that taught deeper meanings to the scriptures. They all taught that plural marriage must be lived to become God's. The Mormon people are taught to believe that the principles contained in the Doctrine and Covenants are the Word of God given to Joseph Smith, our prophet. In searching out the truths, we find that section 132 is devoted to this higher law. Could it be that we hadn't understood fully the plan of salvation and exaltation? God had said, Ask and ye shall receive. The Book of Mormon states, It is given unto many to know the mysteries of God. And he that will not harden his heart to him is given the greater portion of the word, until it is given unto him to know the mysteries of God, until he knows them in full. It was, and still is, a definite promise to all those who are honestly seeking for the truth of life and living. Even so, those troubled thoughts lay dormant in our hearts for some time. They lived in Bingham for one year. Then Carl was offered a job as an electrician at the Utah Copper Plane, now called Kennecott Copper Company. At first this job taxed his theoretical knowledge of electricity. All that he had studied in books seemed just a mass of confusion when he stood by the giant switchboards, stepped in controller room, or worked on the complicated generators. This was the first beginning of knowing that prayers are actually answered. Carl gives this account in his own words. I would look at those machines and wonder where to start. I reasoned with myself. God must have explicit knowledge of the universe, knowing all truths. And for surety, I need this help now. I have a job to do and not much actual experience to go on. By humble prayer, I can put my heart in tune with this great universal spirit, for that must be every man's privilege. I soon found that all of the knowledge of the universe was for man's use, but in his heart must be cleansed from all doubts and fears. He must have faith in the Lord. So through these first few moments, knowledge would come to me and I would know how to do my job. That help would be there when I needed it. Therefore, fast progress was made and I became a foreman, thanks to the goodness of God in a short time. Carl met a man from his priesthood meetings named Oswald Brainich. Brother Oswald was a stake mission president and served over his home country of Holland. He had great stories and great testimonies in the principles of the church. He talked to Carl about the principle of plural marriage. Brother Oswald later admitted to them he already had taken a plural wife. Through this association, Carl and Vita finally knew they were not alone in believing in the principle. Soon they met many church members who were praying and searching as they were. One beautiful moonlit night when all things seemed warm and lovely, Carl and I kneeled in prayer. We prayed together for the truths regarding plural marriage. As our love for each other and our God filled the room, a clear, distinct voice spoke to us saying, Peace be with you. It is true. 
From that time on, there was never any more doubts. In that moment of peace, our hearts were melted into a oneness which would last to life after everlasting. From that time on, we began to work for the goal of love and service to God that we had set on. Then the big question, who should be the girl? We made a list of all the girls that we were acquainted with. We were definitely decided against Hilda, a girlhood friend and chum of mine whom we considered a man-hater and atheist. My cousin Videla Webb was a frequent visitor at our home. We both liked her very much. She seemed to be the logical one for us to ask to be in our family. She liked Carl very much and was in sympathy with the idea. We made our future plans and in general had a good time together. But when she told her mother the lid blew off, Aunt Dora and Uncle George took us right to the state presidency and demanded that he, Carl, be excommunicated from the church. He was cut off from the church that he loved so well before he had even lived the principle. President J.J. J. Danes had this honor or privilege. This brought dishonor to the Ginches, and they promptly disowned us. My mother didn't approve, but stood by us and gave us moral support. My mother had always loved the principal, having had an uncle who lived in almost perfect peace with his four wives. Carl and I studied hard and late at nights. Sometimes we would read until it was time to get up and go to work. This was one of the truly happiest times of my life. Hilda came to see us often. She and I had always been good friends. Her mother died when she was young, and she was raised by an aunt that was a pretty old maid when she was married, so she was set in her ways. Hilda always found refuge in my mother's house. She loved music, and mother took time to teach her the beauty and appreciation of good music. We always played around, even though she was two years my senior. When she graduated from high school, she came to Salt Lake to take nurses training. By the time she had graduated from the LDS hospital, she wondered if there could be a God, as she had seen so much suffering. Of course, she didn't realize then that most of the suffering that humans go through is of their own making. She became a man-hater when she was in training and had to fight off many overindulgent men. So all in all, she had a very dim view of life as she saw it. One day, in one of her visits with us, she and Carl were sitting on the piano bench trying to play duets together. They loved the same kind of music and enjoyed talking over the various compositions. How they were written. I was in the kitchen cooking dinner. I turned around and was surprised to know within myself that they were meant for each other. I was astounded, to say the least, because of her man-hating capabilities. I pondered this over and over and decided against telling Carl about my discovery. Carl and I studied more and more, and we were beginning to feel the presence of God all around us. Early in the morning of February 23, 1928, when my baby Frank, as we then called him, was seven weeks old, we were awakened by a strange noise coming from his crib. I rushed over and saw him lying there, a gray color, coughing and gagging and trying hard to breathe. I picked him up and could feel his lungs wheezing. Carl called Dr. Stevenson, who pronounced it double pneumonia. He advised me to get someone, a nurse if possible, to give him mustard packs to ease his lungs as he passed from this life. I ran over to the neighbors and called Hilda. She was the first that I could think of. She answered the phone and said that she had just come into the room after arriving from a case out of town. She said that she was tired but would come anyway. She had been away from Salt Lake three months on this previous case. She took a bus and came right over. When she saw our baby, she cried, for she knew by his color that there was no hope for him. Carl and I stood watching as she tenderly gathered him in her arms and started to give him mustard plasters, plasters. Then we remembered a promise from God, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Knock, and it shall be opened. We thought of Oswald, who had been teaching us faith and to put our trust in God. When he came over to administer to Frank, Hilda, cynical of a belief in God, let alone of what we were asking of him, left the room. Oswald, 
Carl, and I kneeled down by this baby's crib and humbly asked the father to understand that we loved this baby and wanted to be able to raise him to manhood to give him a chance for a full life here on this earth. Oswald also told the father, Thy will be done, not ours. I can never forget the anxiety in my heart as we started to pray. In my mind's eye, I could see our baby, blue in color, gasping for air, fighting for one minute of life. As Oswald prayed, my feeling of desperation gradually changed to hope that he could be healed. I heard Oswald pray as one man talks to another, and suddenly I knew and believed that God did have great compassion and love, that if we trusted him enough, he would answer our prayers. Thy will be done, I whispered softly. Then calmly I knelt beside my baby. Tears of gratitude streamed down my cheeks. Our son coughed, the first normal sound that he had made for hours. With the cough, he vomited a great deal of yellow-green phlegm. Before our astonished eyes, the pink color of babyhood came back to his little, bo little body, and he looked up to us and smiled. O oh, gracious Father, thank you, thank you. God had touched our child and with his love. Returning to the room, Hilda beheld Frank lying there peacefully and at ease. Then she too knew that there was a God. After it was made known to Hilda through the Spirit of God that the Gospel of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was true, which included plural marriage, she made some very wonderful changes in her attitude towards God. She became softened and mellow and full of love. The light of Christ helped her to understand. Hilda had a very beautiful soul which had been concealed with her cynical attitudes. But by the grace of God, the light consumed the darkness and she was a really happy person for the first time in her entire life. Hilda loved our three children and spent many hours teaching them to read, write, and told them stories. She even taught Frank to say, a dinosaur is a prehistoric mammal. Quite a mouthful for an 18-month-old child. Soon after Frank became well, I asked her if she couldn't think of any man as a husband. She answered that she felt that she could be happy if Carl was her husband. I asked her that if anything happened to me and I lost my life, if she would marry Carl and raise my family for me. She said that she certainly would. Then I said, do I have to die for you to be happy with Carl? There is such a thing as polygamy, you know. Her eyes flashed and she said, bigamy, you mean, and who wants that? I let the subject drop for a day or two, but one day I felt I had to let her know just how Carl and I felt about it all. She took it very well realizing that she and Carl had so much in common, far more than Carl and I had. They loved fine arts, good music, and could make take mental journeys all over the world together, valuing every moment of it. Carl and Hilda were married in April. Their wedding night was one of the happiest nights of my life. I went with them to the home of the elder that was authorized to do these marriages. On our way home, our souls seemed to be filled with a sweet, joyous silence. At last, the burning desire that was kindled almost a year previously was being realized. In the early 1970s, Rio Kunzalra documented interviews with different men affiliated with John W. Woolley. She labeled them reminiscence of John W. Woolley and Lawrence C. Woolley. There were five volumes. Volume three is an interview with Charles Kingston. Volume 2 is an interview with Price Johnson. The second half of Volume 1 is an interview with my father. Within this record, we find the personal relationship Dad held with John W. Woolley. In 1886, President John Taylor was staying at the home of John Woolley. The church was presenting him with a manifesto to sign to disallow plural marriage similar to the manifesto signed later by President Wilfred Woodruff in 1890. President Taylor had the privilege of meeting with the prophet Joseph Smith and also our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that evening. The revelation of 1886 was given and is documented in church records. The next morning, President Taylor held a meeting which lasted eight hours. 
During this meeting, President Taylor refused to sign the manifesto being presented. John Woolley and Lauren Woolley, along with many others, witnessed this event. John Taylor said the day would soon come when the church would discontinue the practice of the principle of plural marriage. He set up a special council to keep the principle alive. He gave this council authority to continue to perform plural marriages. I will now read my dad's words as recorded in Reminiscences, Volume 1. Now I'd like to tell a personal experience dealing with John W. Woolley. On one occasion, when I was living in Salt Lake, I had fasted and prayed on many occasions concerning the principles of the gospel, and I was especially concerned over the principle of plural marriage. I had spent about five or six days in fasting and prayer. I just wanted to know. That's all there was to it. One night, I went to bed and stayed awake praying until about 3 a.m. when I heard a voice. It was just like a still small voice, and yet it was like rolling waters that seemed as if it went from those east hills there to rolling down the mountainside, just like a huge stone. But it was a voice. It was a small, and yet it had such an impact that my whole body was shaking. It rolled across this valley and went clear to those west mountains. And the voice told me that the principles that I had been studying were true. It said, it is true. It is true. Oh, it is true. I sat up in bed and marveled at it. Then it came again, and I marveled more than ever about it. Then when it came the third time, I didn't have any more doubt after that. I told my wife, from this moment on, this is the thing we must do, regardless of the church, religion, or whatever we have been considering in the past. This is the thing we have to do. Where in the world are we going to find anybody? So I started another period of fasting and prayer, and a few months later I came home from work one night, and my little boy was very sick. He was six weeks old and had double pneumonia, and had taken a turn for the worse that morning and was on his deathbed. I walked into that house, looked through the whole house, clear to the kitchen sink, and there stood a girl I didn't easily recognize. Someone put a hand on my shoulder and said, That is the girl you are to marry. That is your wife. She turned around, and when I looked at her, I realized who she was. Oh, no, I said. She can't be. She's a man-hater. And the voice came just as clear as I'm talking to you now. Nevertheless, that is the girl. What could I do? Okay, okay, I said. Well, it is a long story, but I will skip part of it. Finally, it came to the point where we had to find authority. At this particular time, to find authority was one of the most difficult things that you could ever imagine. I had no idea where I should go or what to do, so that started another period of fasting and prayer to know where to go. One day, out of a clear blue sky, I was working with the American Smelting and Refining Company. When I was working alone in my own little shop, a perfect stranger walked in. I happened to have my doctrine and covenants laying there on the bench. He walked over and said, what are you searching for? I told him. He says, okay, I'll help you. This was old brother Worth Kilgrow. And he said, I'll take you to the man. I said, okay. So even at that particular time in the church, this whole thing had been going on. If you wanted to be sealed, you had to go and talk to the man, and he might make you wait as long as six months. And another thing, he would never perform a sealing without revelation. This I testify to here and now. There were no sealings without revelation, whether anybody here on this earth knows this or not, but that's a fact of the matter. So I took my wife and this young lady, Hilda. She was the same age as I, only 10 days difference, and we went there. I left her outside and went in to talk to him. I no sooner walked in than he said, You are Carl Gentsch, yes? I said, Yes, and I had never seen the man. He said, Where is the girl? I never even asked him. I said, Oh, she's out in the car. He said, What's she doing out there? Why don't you bring her in? I asked, now? 
you know, I never had told her. I I had said, well, we're, we are going to have to figure on a six-month wait, and that's all there is to it. Brother John Woolley won't do it. So I went outside and said, Hilda, he wants to talk to you. I took her by the hand and we walked into the house. I'll never forget that man's face. He had a beautiful face. His eyes were piercing. He could look right through you. He could read your thoughts just as if they were written on a page. And his eyes pierced through me and I just faltered, like two hot pokers, you might say. He questioned both of us and then turned to me and said, the only thing I can't understand is what took you so long to get here. I have been waiting for months for you. What took you so long? I know all about you. I'm only talking here so that you'll be at ease. All right, I'm going to seal you two together now. I said, okay. And she said, now? And he said, yes, you have any objections, young lady? She looked at me and looked at him, and she just broke down and said, No, I haven't any. And so he sealed me to my first plural wife for time and all eternity. Hilda was a simple woman who didn't take care of herself very well. She wore old clothes and didn't fix herself up. Hilda had a friend from nursing school who used to talk to her about dressing more professionally at work. Her name was Pauline Olson. Pauline was five foot ten inches tall and a very refined woman. She was very particular about the way she dressed and the way she looked and was very well mannered. Pauline could also carry a tune. She spent two summers working as both an entertainer and nurse at Zion's National Park. Several Hollywood movies were filmed at Zion's while Pauline was working there. She got the chance to meet different actors and even got the chance to dance with Gary Cooper. Pauline would visit her friend Hilda any time she was in Salt Lake. She had spoken with Hilda on several occasions about Hilda's depression and helped her through difficult times throughout their friendship. Shortly after Hilda married into Carl's family, Pauline began hanging out with Hilda's new friends Carl and Vita Gentsch. Pauline noticed that Hilda was no longer depressed and something amazing had changed in Hilda's life. I will now read Pauline's personal account of this experience. Hilda had changed so. Instead of the bitterness and disbelief in God, there was a sparkle in her eyes. Her whole manner had changed. She said she was living with some friends. After some time, she invited me to stay the night with her. We had a wonderful gospel talk with her friends Carl and Vita, his wife. The next time I saw her, I knew she was pregnant. I asked her about this, and she told me she was married to Carl as his plural wife. I felt awful. I felt the manifesto had done away with that and I wanted to show her it was wrong. But as I read the Doctrine and Covenants, I was afraid it might be right. Hilda lost the baby and got infection. I thought for sure she would die. Carl administered to her and she recovered. I fasted and prayed to know if celestial marriage was to be lived now. I went through the Salt Lake Temple to receive my endowments. This was a great privilege. When coming out of the temple, it was as if I had been in another world. There was such a spirit of peace in the temple. Coming out, I was back with the noise of streetcars, hustle and bustle of everyday living, strangers all about you. Carl had asked me to marry him. He had talked it over with Vita and Hilda. That was the way it should be. I told him not until I received my answer from God. I had an invitation from my cousin Ida in San Diego, California to come and visit, so I went. She was married to a Navy officer, and I met their friends and became interested in an officer who was also became interested in me. I taught him Mormonism. He would accept it if I wanted him to, but I wanted him to become a Mormon because he believed and understood. I found out that he had a mistress. I was really upset and knew that was the end. One night after dinner, I went up to the top of the hospital to watch the sunset. I was thinking about Salt Lake and my many friends. When I heard a voice say, go back before it's too late, I turned to see who was there, realizing it hadn't been an audible voice. I wondered what I would tell the administrator. The next morning, I went to her office and told her something had come up at home and I would like to leave as soon as possible, but would give them two weeks notice. That evening, she told me I could leave right away. So I was on the train the next day for Salt Lake. 
I started seeing more of Carl, Vita, and Hilda. Carl asked me again to marry him. I gave him a time limit. I'd give him an answer because I wanted my answer from the Lord. I fasted and prayed. It was the night he was coming to see me, and I still didn't know if it was for me. The prophet Joseph Smith said, No man shall have but one wife at a time, unless the Lord directs otherwise. It was a Sunday evening, and I was alone in the house, kneeling in prayer. I wept and asked to know if plural marriage with Carl was meant for me. As I sat back on the floor, I looked up. It was dusk, and a light came, and a voice said, It's all right. Go ahead. There was also a spirit of great peace that filled me. It wasn't an audible voice, but you never forget it. Carl and I were married June 5, 1930. We all lived in the same house and came from different backgrounds, but our goals were the same, to live the fullness of the gospel, to love, to share, and serve. Carl did a great deal of reading of the old books of the early church Bible and three standard works of the church, and we had some wonderful evenings together. Hilda and I were expecting babies within one month of each other. We had to keep out of sight after we began to show. There were strong feelings against plural marriage, and we lived in a crowded neighborhood. Hilda and I would go out after dark for a walk. I enjoyed these times together. It came time for Hilda's baby to be born. Her delivery was rough. Dr. Woolley had another doctor come and give the anesthetic, and he manually dilated her and delivered her. The baby died, and later that night, Hilda died, I believe from an embolism. It was a sudden death. I went into labor the next day. My delivery was long and hard. I had gone to a friend's home, as I didn't dare to stay at home. I had a beautiful baby boy, David Paul. Hilda's baby was also a boy. Carl buried the baby with Hilda and had a closed casket service. Threats had been made on his life by members of her family, but all went well. I missed Hilda terribly. Of course, so did Carl. He loved her very much, and he went into a depression for some time. Now I'm going to read Vita's account of Hilda's death. On August 15, 1931, Hilda died. Our entire lives began a new cycle. You who have lost ones will know our grief that day. She had started in labor with her second pregnancy, and the same condition existed as with the miscarriage before, except this was a full-termed baby. Two doctors worked over her only to lose the baby during the birth. It was a beautiful black-haired baby boy. He had a remarkable resemblance of the baby I lost. This time Hilda felt that she knew the answer. During the birth, she had heard the doctors decide that she could never have a baby. They felt that there was something so wrong with her physical body that she could never have another pregnancy. It seemed to be a medical impossibility. Hilda, engulfed in her sorrow after such hazardous physical journey, was too weak and tried and tired to remember that God could and had answered prayers. As we fought off bitter tears, she looked up to us and whispered, There is no use, no future for me. I can never have a baby. With a grief-stricken heart and a weary body, she turned her head to one side and sank in a near coma. That night, Carl sat up and watched her every move. In the very early morning, she became restless, then all was quiet. Carl bent over her to hear her heart beat and found her dead. I had grieved over losing the baby so much that I was drained dry when I was told that Hilda was dead. Garda Webb was Carl's fourth wife and was Vita's little sister. Carl married Garda when she was only 16 years old. I will now read Vita's memory of this event. I was called into my mother's home to help care for my youngest sister, Garda. She had contracted scarlet fever and was very sick. Mother was crying when she called me on the phone because Garda was so sick. I left my nursing baby at home with Pauline and went over to help take care of Garda. When I entered the house, she was burning up with a high fever. Mother suggested that I ask Carl to come and administer to her. I called him and he came right down and brought Oswald with him. We had had so many marvelous instant healings in our own family that mother had every confidence that it could be done again. 
Carl and Oswald administered to her and gave her a beautiful blessing of health and wealth in the form of a large posterity. Incidentally, I might add here that Garda lived to bear 13 children. Garda was immediately healed and she sat up and read books the remainder of the day. I took a hot bath and burned the clothes that I was wearing while I was around Garda and went home to my family. It was at that time of this great healing that both Carl and Garda knew that they belonged together in the kingdom of God. Garda's healthy, husky, obedient family are a credit to the family, and we are all proud of them. Carl and Garda were married December 19, 1933. With the marriage of Carl and Garda, opposition ran rampant. People sought to take his life. They broke in our doors and confronted us with guns. Garda came to visit with us at times, and we enjoyed being together. Early one morning, Carl was ready to go to work. He was seized with a terrific stomach pain. He could hardly walk, and his breath became heavier as the pain became more severe. By noon, his pains left him, and he felt so much better. He went to work. Later, we learned that five husky men had been waiting down the road for him that morning. They intended to kill him, or at least do him bodily harm, so the stomach pains had saved his life that day. Things sort of calmed down when the family realized that Garda really wanted to live with us, and she was able to come and live at our home. In the spring of 1935, Carl was asked to join a few men who were starting a settlement in Short Creek, Arizona. Some of the fundamentalist people were trying to farm there and make a home for themselves. Carl, Garda, and Vita's son Frank went with them. They took some furniture and all the canned groceries that they could rake up and felt that they were doing the right thing to help these people to get a start towards religious freedom. In Short Creek, Carl worked very close with many of the brethren. Carl worked alongside men such as Lyman Jessup and Ianthus Barlow. This is also where Carl got to know a good friend, Price Johnson. Price spent time in prison for living plural marriage. He had married a second wife named Helen Hull and was sentenced for unlawful cohabitation. Life in Short Creek was hard. I remember my dad telling me how Garda didn't like having to sweep the dirt floors because none of the homes had hard floors. I'm now going to read Vita's words about this time in Short Creek. Carl, Lyman Jessup, and Ianthus Barlow worked long and hard hours. They put everything into their good, intentional work. Each of them had a certain talent, and they combined them all for the benefit of the community. But when their crops were ready and the chickens and animals were ready for the slaughter, the key men from Salt Lake moved in and expected to take the cream of the crop, and they did, too. They brought all their families and said, Here we are. Feed us. This brought resentments and discontentment, and the feeling of a oneness soon vanished. The priesthood of God merely means God's representation here on this earth. It states clearly in the Doctrine and Covenants that no man shall have any domain over another, that all should work for a common cause, and each man and his family should put forth all the effort that was required to establish a kingdom for their families. But it seemed as though a few of these men felt themselves in a more worthy role of life and far above working and sweating for the benefit of the community. Theirs, so they re reasoned, were a more lofty calling to lead and direct the people and not to be a common worker among them. It seems as though in all walks of life we have the workers and the drones. Living in Short Creek was quite a hardship for all concerned. It was totally unorganized, and most everyone wanted to be the big, unworking boss. But Carl, Lyman Jessup, and Ianthus Barlow and their families worked hard to make a go of it. But it is impossible for an uninspired adventure to succeed, and it didn't. It finally boiled down to one man's opinion against another one's, and who was to say just who was right? I'm sure that our opinions were not any more valuable than that of anyone else's, but Carl did gain some very valuable experiences, however. The three men and their fam families gave all that they had in the way of hard work and their talents and the previously stored food that they had had put away for a hard day that might come. It did right there in Short Creek. 
One Sunday, when Carl came up from Short Creek to visit with us in Salt Lake, I heard on the radio that the state of Arizona was going to raid Short Creek. So Carl, I, and a friend, Pearl Dyke, left to bring Garda home. We were a little ahead of the authorities, so we met with no opposition. We loaded Garda, her son Gerald, and Frank in the car and filled the trailer with her furniture and started back without any sleep. We were sure a sleepy bunch when we arrived in Salt Lake, but it was a good move for us as Carl just couldn't take it there anymore. Lauren Woolley was the last man alive from the original council set apart by President Taylor. Lauren's father, John Woolley, had been given the keys to the patriarchal order to seal families for time and all eternity. Lauren had called new members to this council. Lauren Woolley died in 1934 and left Leslie Broadbent as the senior member to the council. Vita mentions here in this last clip that a friend, Pearl Dyke, helped move Carl and Garda out of Short Creek. She was a good friend of Hilda and Pauline and was also a very good nurse. Pearl was engaged to Leslie Broadbent. However, Leslie became terminally ill in 1935 before the marriage could be solemnized. After Leslie died, Pearl still wanted to live plural marriage, so, so she asked Carl to marry her. On July 7, 1935, Pearl Dyke became my father's fifth wife for time only. I was told she was sealed to Leslie Broadbent for eternity. In this next segment, Vita talks about Pearl's short time in the family. How different Pearl was. Her heart was restless and unsatisfied. She seemed steeped in selfish ambitions and desires. For the first time, jealousy and selfishness came into our home. She appointed herself the leader and very often told us what to do and how to do it. Doubt, suspicion, and mistrust seemed to rule her heart, and we as a family became involved with the same. She was a very unhappy woman, and she managed to spread her unhappiness wherever she went. After a long siege of this contention, she left to go live with a friend. Soon after this, she became ill, and realizing that she was dying, she called Carl to her bedside and begged his forgiveness. On her deathbed, she was sorely repentant for the disruption she had caused. Losing Pearl was the second great shock in our lives, perhaps an even greater one than losing Hilda. We now realized what we could have done to help this unhappy person. Had we been endowed with more wisdom and love at this time, we would have realized that love overcomes all things. We would have measured life by principle rather than personalities and would have saved Pearl and ourselves all the heartaches and bitterness that, that was our lot then. But it seems that the purposes of God and our own soul's growth are achieved by the things that we suffer. For then only do we seem to learn. We must experience the bad with the good that we might learn to choose the right. I do not mean that Pearl was bad, but she did bring unrest in our home, and it was many years before we were capable of gathering the loose ends of our former state of happiness and learn to evaluate and hold on to the truths of love. I hope that she can forgive us as we have long forgiven her for this misfortune. Carl's father, Arthur Eugene Gench, had an association with a fellow stonemason and carpenter named Otto Toomey. They worked on various jobs together, including the Salt Lake Temple and the Mormon Battalion Monument on the Utah State Capitol grounds. Otto had three wives. My dad met Otto's daughter, Helen Toomey, through this association. Garda and Helen became friends, and she stayed with Helen after she had her first baby. After a short courtship, Helen became my dad's sixth plural wife on September 12, 1936. She was 18 years old. She began her marriage by sharing an apartment on K Street in Salt Lake City with Carl's third wife, Pauline. Helen would babysit Pauline's children while Pauline did private nurse's duty for some of the big name Mormon leaders. Pauline was disappointed in these church authorities because of their lack of conviction to the fullness of the gospel. I will now read Pauline's insight on these church authorities. I went back to work when my baby was six months old. I continued doing private duty. I was called to take care of many of the church authorities and their families, such as Charles W. Penrose, Mrs. George Albert Smith, 
Oscar Kirkham, LeGrand Richards, Mr. Hardy, Mrs. David O. McKay, also President David O. McKay, and Senator Bennett's mother, a very special lady. I didn't gain the spiritual insight I might have gained from them because I felt they were so wrong for having given up the principle of plural marriage. It was only recently I received an answer to a prayer. God forces no man to enter his kingdom. It is a matter of choice. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints chose to give up the law of celestial marriage rather than lose property to the government and receive statehood. There was a way open to keep the law alive. It was in the days of President John Taylor. I'm now going to read from Vita's journal. It was in 1945 when two FBI men came into the school and asked for me. They said that they were about to arrest a few polygamists and they wanted me to tell them all that I knew about a few that were about to be arrested. They said that if I would do that, they would see to it that Carl would not be arrested. I just plainly told them that I knew nothing personally about any of them. No matter what they asked me, I just said that I just simply did not know. They finally, after one hour and a half, left. A few days later, 40 men were arrested. Later on, they were sent to prison. They never ever called on Carl. We never did know why he wasn't among the ones that were arrested. They were in prison for about a year. Shortly before Pauline married into the family, while she was staying with Hilda, she was called out to deliver a baby for one of Oswald Brainick's wives. She had Carl drive her out to the birth. It was the middle of February, in the middle of a snowstorm, and so on the way they encountered terrible road conditions. He began to get angry and started cursing at the storm. Pauline turned to him and said, You better stop grumbling. That baby might be your wife someday. The baby's name was Elizabeth Brainick, or Betty for short. My dad did end up marrying that baby when she turned 18 years old. Carl married Betty as his seventh plural wife on April, th April 30, 1948. When Betty came to live with the family, it seemed to round out their entire lives. Betty had bright brown eyes that twinkled whenever she looked your way. Her sparkling wit and humor had brought sunshine into the family's lives that they simply needed at that time. She had a quick temper to go with it, though. In 1948, my dad lost sight in his right eye. I will now read from Vita's history of this incident. In the fall of 1948, Carl had a serious accident to his eye. He was working on an electric saw, and when it disintegrated, a piece of metal flew into his right eye. Pauline rushed him to the hospital, and he remained there about ten days. He lost the sight in the one eye, and when he returned home, he was told that he may lose the sight of the other one. The situation seemed to be serious, so as on the other occasions, we called in Brother Brainick and asked him to administer to Carl. All of Carl's family and part of the Brainick family sat together in close harmony of thought. We read and discussed the scriptures, and we were a oneness of heart. All through the evening I was suffering with neuritis of the left shoulder. I had been in almost continuous pain with this, sometimes more severe than other times, especially during the cold weather. This particular night I was in real pain. All the while we talked and discussed different aspects of religion, I was squirming with pain. When our minds became a harmonious oneness, we all joined hands and formed a prayer circle. Brother Brainick started to pray and asked God to bless us with perfect health and happiness. He also said a beautiful prayer for Carl. While he was praying, I had a flashback of when Hilda, Carl, and I knelt and prayed so many times together. I felt Hilda's closeness. I seemed to accept that she too was there joining in our prayers for our husband. Tears of gratitude for the great blessings that we all had enjoyed from the hand of God filled my eyes. I hardly heard the prayers that were so beautifully being uttered as I meditated upon the happiness and love we three had for each other. As I was lifted up in thankful memories, I felt that someone, someone precious to my memories, was standing by my side. 
Then I felt a touch on my shoulder, a soft touch at first, but as more pressure was put to my afflicted shoulder, I was brought back to consciousness that I was standing with the others in a prayer circle, praying for Carl's eye to be saved. Then suddenly I realized that the terrific pain was completely gone. I was free of all pain the first time in eight years. When the prayers were over, Brother Brainick was overcome with emotion as he sat down. I understood for a certainty his deep feeling when he softly said, Hilda was in this room with us tonight. I too knew this to be a truth, for she stood close between Carl and I. Her prayers were uttered with ours. Her love was mingled with the love of Carl's and the Brainick family. Carl's eye was saved. My shoulder was completely healed. That was an evening to always be remembered. In 1955, the law started taking notice of Carl's family. Vita tells her account of this problem. In September of 1955, we noticed two detectives watching our homes with binoculars. They would park across the street and sit there for hours. Just what they hoped to gain by their sleuthing was anyone's guess. We have lived our religious lives openly for 26 years. Carl has signed the birth certificates of all his children with his own name and all of his wives and children use that name. What more evidence could they require? Anyway, we had our fun wondering just what those two detectives were discovering, even though we did realize the seriousness of the situation. On Saturday, October 23rd, Carl called his family together and asked that whoever was willing to fast the next day, which was Sunday, to please do so. We had had reports from loyal friends and neighbors that detectives had been inquiring and requesting information about our living habits. We knew, finally, that trouble was coming. That Sunday evening, we had our usual get-together and then, very sincerely, asked God what our next move should be. The Lord surely heard our prayers and answered them, for we all rose from our knees with the same answer. We were to stay with our homes and take the consequences of any. After all, we believed this principle of plural marriage with all of our hearts and could not be ashamed of it or of our living together. My dad gave himself up to the authorities and after several hearings came before the district court in Farmington, Utah, to the vital question of whether or not he would forsake the practice and advocation of polygamy, my dad replied that he could not deny his religion. On December 13, 1955, he entered the Utah State Prison to begin a sentence not to exceed five years. Over 150 newspaper articles across the country had run a story on my father. Carl had developed himself into a very good electrician before he was incarcerated. So while in prison, he kept himself busy by helping with any electrical work they needed. The guards once had him doing work outside the prison compound and forgot they had had him working out there. They trusted him. Carl was very well liked by both the guards and prisoners. Vita supplied him with many sets of scriptures that he distributed to the inmates whom he taught the gospel. He was also visited by many demons who challenged him and his testimony. Once he was tossed out of his own bed onto the floor by a demon. Another time he awoke frozen with a demon trying to choke him. He rebuked the demons in the name of Jesus Christ. I remember my father teaching me how to rebuke evil spirits when I was very little. He became very despondent, but after he conquered self-pity, he was able to reach a high and contact the Holy Spirit of God. He was also visited by many spiritual beings. When Carl came up for parole, he was praying and meditating on what to say to the parole board. He was laying down in bed facing the wall when some writing showed up on the wall. The writing said, Tell them not in the state of Utah. So when the parole board asked him if he would continue to advocate, teach, or countenance the practice of polygamy, he answered that he intends to comply with the laws of the state of Utah. They were satisfied with his answer and they recommended his release. My dad was released from prison on January 8, 1957, after serving 14 months of his five-year sentence. My mother had spent a year living in Arizona when she was 23. 
After she moved back to Utah, she would spend her time with her sister Ruby. Ruth had a car she had brought back from Arizona, so Ruby would often have Ruth drive her around. Ruby, Theron, and Ruth all could carry a tune and were asked to sing at different events from time to time. Ruth met Carl's daughter Joni through these associations. Joni was also very musically talented. Carl's grown children were having spiritual meetings at Joni's house. Ruth was invited to attend these meetings where she met one of Carl's sons. Ruth became interested in him. He could also sing very well because he got his voice from his mother. Ruby and Ruth were invited to sing at a reception of one of Carl's children. Ruth drove Ruby to the event. As Ruth walked up the stairs to enter, my dad passed her coming out the door. She saw Carl for the first time and said to herself, Oh, so that's his father. She had a very good feeling about him. Carl said he couldn't stay for the reception because he had to get to Monticello. That's where he was working at the time. Carl worked around on various electrical installations. At the reception, my mother was asked to sing also. After she sang, Carl's son pulled her off to the side and talked to her. He was a very deep spiritual person, getting that from both his parents. Ruth thought he was very interesting and attached herself to him in her heart. Ruth continued to attend the Gench meetings in hopes to see him there. My dad noticed Ruth would attend the family meetings regularly. As my dad was getting to know my mother, he received direction that she was to be his wife. Ruth tells the story. One time, while Carl was eating lunch at work with his back against the wall, he saw a vision of a woman standing there holding a young boy in one hand and a young girl in the other. The woman's back was turned away so Carl couldn't see who the woman was. Carl knew whoever the woman was had at least two children that were his children. The woman turned around and Carl recognized me, the gal who attended his family meetings. He said to himself, Oh no, she won't be interested in me. I'm old and I'm ugly. She wouldn't want to marry someone old and someone who was missing an eye. In that moment, he dismissed it, but his guardian angel, who was always there to give him revelation throughout his life, put his hand on his shoulder and said, Yes, she is your wife and those are your children. Those children were my two eldest, Patricia and Dan. I began to notice that Carl showed interest in me. I started to drive Carl home from Farmington to Salt Lake to Helen's home because Carl didn't have a ride. My sister Ruby and girlfriend named Gilda were usually with us. While driving, we would talk to Carl about the gospel and different spiritual experiences. I felt very safe because I was with Ruby and also I knew Carl was a very good man. There was always a good feeling around him. It came to the point that Carl told me he'd received something on me. He didn't tell me what it was, but I knew it meant marriage. I thought that I didn't want to marry him because I was interested in someone else. And he was already an old man. I told him that I was in love with someone else. So he told me, Okay, I can release you. I said, Oh no, don't do that. I had this fear inside of me that I would lose him. I hadn't realized it was there. I didn't realize I felt that way about him. So then I was torn because I wanted a younger man, but I also wanted to hold on to Carl. I told him that I don't think I can take you home anymore. I want you to stay away from me for a while. But I said to him, I don't want you to release whatever you received of me. I don't want you to lose that. I kept praying about it. I would ask God, what is your will? What do you want me to do? Give me something that I may know the truth of what Carl's received. Carl hadn't told me what he received, but the Spirit said that what Carl received was the truth. Carl stayed away for a week, then showed up one night at my work. He was going to take me home because my car wasn't working. We climbed in the car and just sat. I said, I have been praying about it to have God let me know what was the truth. As we were talking, something suddenly just came out of me. Something inside me exploded. Light filled the car. I said, I do love you. It just filled my heart and my soul. The whole car was filled with light. Carl's face shone through that light and was brighter than the light in the car. 
My mind and my heart just opened up and the truth came to me. It is true. I knew I was to be married to him. After I knew, nothing would deter me from marrying him and to be in his family. My mother married my father on February 8, 1959 and became his eighth wife. Around that time, the grand jury started doing investigations on different fundamentalists. Carl had all the families go into hiding. He took my mother to California to hide away from the law for fear of being thrown back in prison. After Carl left, the families all moved back home. The state interrogated each one of Carl's children while Carl stayed away from Utah. He had made a promise to abide the Utah state laws of cohabitation on his parole, so he made the decision to move to Oregon to start a new life. He later moved the rest of his family with him. His older children were grown and some married, and many of them stayed in Utah. In 1965, my mom Ruth had four kids, and my dad let her know he was no longer going to have any more children. He was 64 at the time he had had his 41st child, and he was afraid that he would not live long enough to raise them. Seven years later, he would change his mind. My dad had a guardian angel who used to visit him on occasion and show him the secrets of the universe. He was told to keep these secrets to himself, so we never got the privilege to hear what he was being shown. One day, this angel came to Carl in a vision. He took him around and showed him many wonderful things. Toward the end of my dad's tour of the heavens, the angel brought him to a place where there were some young girls playing in a circle. He said they were wearing blue dresses and the children were playing a game similar to Ring Around the Rosie. As he was watching those young girls play, one of them broke away from the circle and came over to Carl, took his hand and said, Won't you be my daddy? He looked at the little girl and felt the desire to bring this little girl to earth to be by his side. Nine months later, I was born in Eugene, Oregon on April 26, 1973. My dad was 72 when I came to him. When I was born, he looked at me and said, what a little jewel. And my mother said, that's her name, Jennifer Jewel. My dad and I were the best of friends, and he got the opportunity to raise me because he was retired from work. We were extremely close. I used to lay close to him every night, and he used to talk to me about spiritual things and about stories from his past. I spent many hours underneath his arm listening to him talk and absorbing as much information as my young little brain could absorb at five years old. I asked many questions and listened to everything he had to say. I remember he had a framed picture on his bedroom wall, and when I come in to visit him, I read it over and over. 3 Nephi 14.7 Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. It was almost as if he was putting all he had learned in his lifetime into me as a final effort to pass it on to someone who could carry it on. Because he was spiritually close to the other side, I seem to have been blessed with the ability to understand things at a very young age. As I got older, those teaching moments would become less frequent, and I have trouble remembering all the details he shared with me. But he left with me a strong desire to know God's will and to always do what is right. When my dad was little, he remembers always being hungry. He said that for food, the family would have mush for breakfast and mush for dinner. One time, he had gotten a banana for Christmas. It tasted so good to him that he took it and sliced it up as thin as he possibly could. He would then stick the slice in his mouth and enjoy the flavor as long as he could. He also raised a large family and food was always scarce. His father had tried farming and in Utah, food doesn't grow very well. So when he moved to Oregon and he saw how well things grew, he developed a green thumb. We always had a big garden at my mom's house. I spent the spring and summer helping him grow food for the family. His garden was so impressive, strangers used to pull their car over to the side of the road to get out to admire it and also to discuss the bountiful harvest that existed on our property. We always had way too much food for our family, so he always loaded these strangers up with as much food as they were willing to take. 
He also grew the biggest pumpkins around, and so at Halloween, we always had the best jack-o'-lanterns. While I was still little, my dad used to carve out the pumpkins and stuff me inside of it for a fun photo opportunity. I enjoyed being daddy's little girl. When I was about 10 years old, my mom and dad and I went on a trip to Utah and Colorado. My dad was concerned about the state of the world and was looking for a place of refuge. He was particularly interested in a place where there was plenty of water. I remember traveling to Utah and going through Green River and even on into Colorado. He was hoping Green River was more green and was really disappointed. So we traveled to a valley in Colorado where there was plenty of water. However, the valley had been flooded and my dad felt like it wasn't a safe place. We went home to Oregon disappointed. A couple years later, I had a dream that indicated for the first time Heavenly Father had extraordinary plans for me. In this dream, my mom and dad and I were traveling around in the car looking for a place of refuge, just like we had done in real life. I remember looking very carefully through the car window for a place that would work for us. As I was searching, I spotted a green spot in the distance at the base of a really tall mountain. The mountain was brown and the area seemed void of water. But this particular spot had plenty of water and could, su could sustain a lot of people. I got excited and pointed to the green spot to my parents and said, Look, there's the kingdom of God. They had trouble seeing it and I was the one who found it and brought it to their attention. As I focused my attention on this particular spot, I could see into the future. The world was at war and there were bombs flying overhead. I could feel the chaos and the fear that was created from this war. The bombs flying over this green spot couldn't recognize that this safe haven even existed. It had remained hidden from the outside world. I could also see there was a bubble of protection, like a force field surrounding the whole area. The protection came from the power of the righteous people inside. This power is what helped the people to remain hidden. I woke up from the dream feeling like I was protected and that there was a very powerful message. However, at 12 years old, I just couldn't understand what the message could be. Most dreams I'd had over the years were long forgotten, but for some reason, this one stuck with me and would come back to my memory from time to time. Sometimes there were challenges having an older dad. First of all, everybody at school always assumed he was my grandpa, which for a young teenager could be a little embarrassing. Second of all, talking to him over the phone was difficult because he was hard of hearing. There were times I would wait at the school until midnight because he couldn't hear the phone ring, or when he did answer the phone, he couldn't hear that I was asking him to pick me up. Third, he was also a very slow driver. One time, my mom and I were heading home, and we got stuck behind a long train of about 10 cars. The train of cars was going extremely slow, and we were wondering what was going on. As the head of the train rounded the corner ahead of us, we could see the leader of the train. What I saw was my dad's big blue station wagon leading the way. Both my mom and I had a good laugh. One of the hardest things about having an older dad was having that underlying dread that one day your father would pass away just because of his age. Once when I was in sixth grade, my girlfriend from down the street knocked on our front door and the first thing she said when I opened it was, I think your dad is dead. I believed her because that fear was always there. I started screaming and ran outside to the car where he had passed out from exhaustion. It was warm out and he was tired from driving to town and back. So when he got home, he threw the door open to stay cool and fell asleep with his mouth open on the driver's side of the car. His false teeth were falling out and to my girlfriend, he probably looked dead. I realized in that moment just how much fear I had buried and how devastating it would be to lose him, especially if it was so sudden. When I was 16, my dad suddenly became ill. I was with my mother in Salt Lake visiting Dolly and the Pollard family when we heard the news over the phone. He had lost 20 pounds in a month with no explanation and we were all very concerned. My mom and I rushed home to see his frail little body in turmoil. I remember the moment I walked into his bedroom with the intention to greet him and tell him how much I loved him. He was asleep on the bed and I was afraid to wake him. 
So instead, I peered through the doorway and watched his steady, slow breaths. I felt lightheaded and scared as I stood in the doorway. Deep down, I knew this was the beginning of the end and that I needed to remember this moment and that I needed to savor every moment I had left with him. I wasn't ready to let him go. He was my spiritual leader, my friend, my father, my whole world. My family wanted to do everything we could to help prolong his life. However, my dad refused to go to the doctor and insisted on trying to take care of the problem himself using natural methods. He called the hospital a butcher shop. Having been born in 1901 when medical knowledge was limited, he learned how to be self-sufficient and doctor himself through natural means. So he proceeded to try various remedies to relieve the digestive issues he had developed. Because he never went to the doctor, we didn't know what the problem was, and his health continued to deteriorate over the course of the next two years. An uneasy, sick feeling settled in on me, and I found myself frequently sad. I could tell my mom was going through the same thing, and watching him deteriorate made us withdraw. Even though we were sick with worry, we both had to figure out how to live life as normal as possible. Everyday tasks became laborious and taxing. And how do you tell your friends you are struggling? That when you go home at night, you hear your father dry heaving in the bathroom and how he moaned and groaned because of the intense pain he felt frequently. No doctor had been able to inform us of why he was in this condition or why he felt the way he did. Sometimes the unknown was what was the very hardest on us. This was a busy time in my life. I spent all day at school, and when school let out for the day, I went to practice or games. I enjoyed sports because it was one way I could release the anxiety I was feeling. I would leave at 8 in the morning, and I wouldn't come home until 10 o'clock at night, usually coming home from practice or a game. My dad saw how busy I was, and so even in this weakened state, he always made me breakfast and packed my lunches. I never asked him to do it or ever expected him to, but he seemed to enjoy getting the chance to raise his last child. I would wake up in the morning and my breakfast would be sitting on the table with the vitamins at the top of the plate. I played volleyball and basketball and ran track and cross country. I enjoyed getting out and developing my abilities. I especially liked competing against the boys. I worked very hard at keeping up with my grades, even with this grueling schedule, and at graduation, I was awarded salutatorian of my class. I remember how difficult it was to get my dad to my graduation. His frail little body couldn't take the moving and jostling around very well, but he insisted on being there. As I stood up to give my salutatorian speech, I looked out into the audience and saw my dad crying. He was often very proud of me and my accomplishments, and in this moment I was proud to be his daughter. It meant the world to me to have him there, but I knew things didn't look well for him. I pushed these bad thoughts out of my mind as I always had done for two years. It was what I always had done to feel normal, to not feel the dread I knew was inevitable. To lose my father meant I lost my own life, my best friend, the person I came to earth for. I was just beginning my life and I needed him to help answer the tough questions. I spent the summer working at Dairy Queen and weeding a sugar beet field. I was preparing to go to college in the fall and so I worked hard to save up my money. My good grades gave me enough scholarship money to have the first year of the community college paid for. I was offered a running scholarship at a university but it wasn't a full ride so I turned it down. As the summer wore on, my father became more and more frail, while I became more and more in denial. I just couldn't face the truth, and still not knowing why he was in this condition gave me some hope it could be fixed. I started my first semester in college at Lane Community College in late September of 1991. I was hopeful I would have a good year because I had proven to be a good student in high school. However, one week later, my whole life would change drastically. Some of my half-siblings came out to my mom's house to check on my dad. He was in so much pain, he could hardly get off the couch. They talked to him about his condition and asked him if he was ready to go to the doctor. He told them, I am done. They took him to the hospital for the first time in two years since he had gotten sick. 
It was colon cancer, and it had spread so badly it was everywhere. The doctors went in and cleaned everything out as much as possible, but his frail body had been sick for too long. He had a stroke on the operating table and never came out of the surgery coherent. He was unconscious for about a week, and then he passed away on October 4th, 1991. I never got to say goodbye. Heavenly Father honored my dad's commitment to raising every one of his children before he left this life. I was 18 years old when he passed away, and he was survived by all 42 of his children. This spiritual giant had moved on. All his experiences, all his lessons and knowledge hopefully had been passed on to his family.